This section is on treatment protocols for common running injuries. I'm going to try to give the most up-to-date information with um, pro uh, proven treatment protocols that have been uh, evaluated, um, where people look for different things in runners that um, could explain why certain injuries go chronic. And, and this uh, classic Achilles non-insertional tendinopathy, this paper um, uh, was, it came out in 2008. They took um, all these different athletes, uh, runners with uh, Achilles non-insertional, the Achilles hurts just a little bit higher than the attachment point. They did three-dimensional imaging, and um, they showed that in every situation during their push-off phase, the people with Achilles insertional, non-insertional tendinopathy failed to externally rotate the tibia during late mid stance. The control groups all were able to do that, so it was a real difference where it stood out. So again, in this paper by Williams et al., um, in the transverse plane, athletes with Achilles non-insertional tendinopathy failed to externally rotate the tibia um, during the late mid-stance phase of the gait cycle. The authors said possibly that it could have something to do with tibialis, posteri tibialis posterior not um, properly functioning. Um, the standard treatment protocols that everybody's aware of by now, uh, heavy load uh, eccentric exercises, you go up with two feet, slowly lower yourself with just one, backpack full resistance, the mistake people make with this is often they don't do full range. Um, some research shows, because you know, how does the tendon know whether there's a concentric or an eccentric component um, to the firing of the muscle? And I found an interesting paper that showed that during the eccentric component with heavy resistance, the muscle vibrated a little bit more. And you can do it yourself when you pull up with a heavy weight, it's smooth, but when you lower, there's a slight vibration. And some people feel that vibration stimulated tendon repair. But after reading that um, prior paper that I had just uh, illustrated, where the people failed to externally rotate, heavy load eccentric exercises do not correct transverse plane problems. So after I read that paper, I just went to performbetter.com. I got a couple of ankle straps that people use when they're doing weightlifting. I got some yellow TheraBands. I just strapped them around. And every athlete that I have that has this, I just have them put that device. You see it on the right side of your screen. Um, they'll just separate their feet slightly and then raise and lower their arch. It's really easy. That forces you to externally rotate the tibia as you're pushing out. Great tibialis posterior strengthening exercise to do closed chain. The classic tibialis posterior exercise, seated with um, a TheraBand wrapped around the forefoot, raising and lowering. You can emphasize just the eccentric component of that if you want. I'll do that sometimes with tibialis posterior tendonitis is where you'll just have your hand to hold it. EMG studies show that tibialis posterior fires most efficiently when working in the transverse plane. So I'll throw in that exercise as well. But I noticed that when I started doing this exercise on the right, my outcomes for the non-insertionals, I do it with the heavy load eccentrics, outcomes definitely increased. Insertional Achilles tendonitis are, are a different matter. In my opinion, much more difficult to treat. The non-insertional happens two to three centimeters above the insertion of the Achilles on the calcaneus. The insertional Achilles tendonitis tend to happen in cavovarus foot types, and when they do stress tests on them where they evaluate the exact location of um, tendon injury, if you look at that picture on the right, the location B is where most of the tendon damage happens. But during the gait cycle, um, uh, the most stress on the Achilles tendon is on the back fiber. Um, it's called stress shielding. They proved it with the rotator cuff tendons too that the section of the tendon that is under the least stress is the one that breaks down. You would think with an insertional Achilles that it would be the back fiber because when the leg is behind you and you're going to seven times body weight, you're going to be putting a greater percentage of pressure on the, the posterior aspect of that tendon. But some great research shows that in almost every case, it's the forward aspect of the tendon that gets damaged. Deep tissue massage in there to stimulate repair. Um, Graston, if you're familiar with it, to stimulate repair in there. But um, this protocol was proven to be very effective where you don't let the heels drop below. They showed that when your ankles drop down low, the forefoot was dorsiflexed slightly and your heels were below the level of the stairway, tons of stress was put on the back fiber of the Achilles tendon. But when you go way up on your tiptoes up like this, then you stress the anterior aspect of the tendon. That's the tendon aspect of the tendon that gets damaged. So I have people do eccentric loads but on a level surface, a study came out in British Journal of Medicine that showed that it had really nice outcomes. 
but I emphasize you have to go as high as you can to stress the anterior aspect of the tendon. Interesting research because it showed that the section of the tendon applied to least force broke down. It wasn't the area that was being overloaded. Um, metatarsal stress fractures, very, very common in runners, um, it almost always mistreated. And, uh, very few people look beyond where that metatarsal stress fracture is. Um, the number one cause, uh, the number one and two causes of metatarsal stress fractures Isolated tightness in the gastrocnemius muscle will cause an early heel lift. You can go to seven times body weight loaded on the central metatarsal shafts, especially if you have a hypermobile first ray. If your first metatarsal is loose, if you have a thumb radius index where you're very flexible, um, uh, you can get into trouble with hypermobility of the first ray. But in this situation, I look back to that paper by Ferris in a foot and ankle journal, and they showed with that um, uh, pedal bar graph that I talked about, if you're really strong in your flexor digitorum longus, you can unload the central metatarsal shafts by 35%. If you are not, instead of bearing weight by supporting pressure beneath the tips of the toes, you transfer all that pressure to the metatarsal shafts, compound metatarsal head, compound that to an early heel lift from a tight gastroc, and those metatarsals will chronically fracture. Address the equinus or the tight gastrocnemius, and address the toe weakness. To evaluate toe weakness, there is a great test, of, uh, uh, a great guy by the name of Hilton Menz, he's a researcher from Australia, um, did a paper on it a little while ago. You just take a conventional business card, put it underneath the seconds for fifth toes, I'll do it in a second. Um, you pull it out, if someone's weak in their toes, they cannot stop you from pulling that piece of paper out. The exercise that I, it's called the paper grip test, predicts um, uh, toe strength, good integrator reliability. Some other research has shown that weakness in the toes can predict falls in the elderly. Really important during the gait cycle. Um, flexor hallux, flexor digitorum longus is a synergist to the Achilles. So if someone has an Achilles injury, I like to strengthen the toes as well. Um, by itself, the long digital flexors can produce a heel lift. So if they're weak, you can overload the Achilles in addition to um, stressing the metatarsals. The strengthening exercise, because flexor house is longest, is a different muscle than flexor digitorum longus. I like to strengthen them separately, and I'll review that test in a second. Okay, this test is called the paper grip test. It has a very high uh, integrator reliability, predicts weakness of the intrinsic muscles. All you need is a business card. It takes a second to do. Position the seated patient so their heels in contact with the ground, forefoot's in contact with the ground, and then I instruct them. I'm going to put a, a, a standard piece of paper or a business card under their toes. Then with them holding at the forefoot and heel, not raising the heel, I want them to resist or try to stop me from pulling it out. And um, you see how easily I can pull that out? Uh, it, Normally, if someone's strong, uh, four or five kilograms of pressure and you can't pull that out, but if there's weakness in the intrinsic muscles, again, it can occur with plantar fasciitis, can occur with metatarsal stress fractures. You should do this test in anybody where you suspect um, intrinsic weakness could be causing an injury. Just put it under, hold that down, stop me. So uh, it should be hard for me to pull this out. So that's a sign that there's weakness in the intrinsic muscles, flexor digitorum longus, flexor digitorum brevis. Start this, when you're doing this portion, hands are against the wall for balance, and you just raise your heel with your feet first on the outside, then slowly roll to the inside. When you do this exercise, um, and that's a little bit too high, so let me have you start, your feet are going to, your arches are going to be elevated, and now you're going to raise up slowly, roll in, stop there, now drive down with the toes. It's very important that you see the foam compress in through here. Kim has really good strength in her intrinsics and you see that wink sign there. You also see how deep she's going with the great toe. When she is up in this position, there's a muscle called abductor halysis. It's right in through here. That muscle is firing vigorously. You can put your finger on it, you can feel it. That muscle um, prevents the formation of bunions. It's important with arch elevation and it's important with the transfer of force from the rear foot to the forefoot and then you go down. So typically how this is done, you cycle up just like that, push the toes down, hold it for a second or two, and then go down and roll out. So as you go up, you roll in. As you go down, you roll out. Interdigital neuritis is another injury um, that is common in runners. 
high arch people have a tendency to push off the lateral side of the foot. It tends to be very common in that foot type. Again, isolated a, a tightness in the gastrocnemius. Steve Giovanni showed that that can increase the risk of interdigital neuritis. Um, previously, the research on interdigital neuritis suggested that the nerve got caught under the transverse ligament. Um, they'll, they'll sometimes section that ligament. They have different medical treatments for it. But this research just came out a little while ago that showed that the metatarsal head did not, uh, the interdigital nerve did not get caught um, beneath the transverse ligament. Um, they did cadaveric studies that showed that the interdigital nerve got caught beneath the proximal aspect of the phalanx and the metatarsal head. And it was happened a little bit farther down from where the transverse ligament is. It changed the way I treated interdigital neuritis is because prior to that, I would focus on lessening pressure behind it. I would try to use metatarsal pads, different things to control or lift up the shafts of the metatarsals. But once you saw that the injury happened later in the propulsive period when the metatarsal head was pushing down on the interdigital nerve, I started using U-shaped balances. You can add it to an orthotic. I'll usually just take an insole. They sell compressed felt that's eighth inch thick. You just make, you follow this cut out. I like to, sometimes I'll support just the first and the fifth. You'll just cut a U-shaped pattern, put it on the bottom of that met pad, on the bottom of the insole. Uh, extremely effective. I started doing this after I read the paper that showed that interdigital neuritis is, uh, are pinched downstream. They get pinched beneath the distal aspect of the met head and the proximal phalanx. Outcomes with this improve greatly. Sesamoiditis, very common injury, especially in cavovarus foot types. Um, as I mentioned previously, Peronius longus becomes hyperactive in cavovarus foot types, brings the first metatarsal head. If you look at that picture on the left, about 14% of the population has plantar flex first metatarsals. A small percentage of those have rigid plantar flex first metatarsals where they're just really tight. Normally, if you look at a pressure pattern of a, a neutral or a slightly pronated foot, most of the pressure is borne in the central aspect of the metatarsal. The second, third, and fourth metatarsals bear most of the weight. In this foot type, it's like a tripod. The lateral heel, the sesamoid, and the fifth bear almost all the weight. That balance, I reviewed, I reviewed a few of them in the orthotic section. Balance is a very effective way to lessen pressure on the sesamoid. In addition to that, coming up, if you do make an orthotic, which I usually don't for high arch people, but if, if you do, um, coming up and supporting beneath the center of the arch is a very nice way to support beneath, um, and support the arch and take pressure off the sesamoid. Again, metatarsal pads do not alter pressure on the sesamoids. Um, and this is an important component. Everybody, when they treat sesamoid injuries, most people just treat it by lessening pressure on the sesamoid. But the sesamoid bone, just like the patella is a sesamoid bone, it sits in the flexor hallucis brevis muscle. If the flexor hallucis brevis muscle is tight, which it almost always is, it responds to the pain of the injury by tightening. Once the sesamoid injury goes away, you're left with contracture of the flexor hallucis brevis. Easy to measure. Just measure first MTP dorsiflexion, compare the two sides. If it's limited, you have to restore mobility. Um, as I mentioned previously, quad tightness is an, a great, one of the best predictors, asymmetrical quad tightness of retropatellar pain. If the quad is tight, it pulls the patella, sesamoid bone, into the femoral condyles, produces um, con compression and chronic trouble. Everybody knows that you should loosen up the quad. No one ever loosens up flexor hallucis brevis. I love this. Just look up the origin of it. It sits on the cow, uh, comes off the cuboid. Um, get into the center of it. Do deep tissue massage, alternate it with light muscle energy. You don't want to irritate the sesamoid. Um, that, within a four to six week period of time, usually restores range of motion of flexor hallucis brevis. I show people how to do it at home. I'll give them this illustration. Light massage followed by stretching. It doesn't take a lot. A couple of minutes here, a couple of minutes there, and they can usually restore motion to that. Nice because it lessens the potential for the sesamoid injury to come back. Um, because if you don't correct this, just like if you didn't correct an asymmetrically tight quad, the retropatellar pain will come back. Same thing happens with sesamoid injuries. Plantar fasciitis, uh, you treat runners, you're going to see tons of these. Things to differentially diagnose, Baxter's neuropathy, that picture in the top right. Um, just have your patients abduct their toes. If they can abduct the fifth on one side but not the other, they could have an injury to the Baxter's nerve. The nerve to abductor digiti mini, minimi is um, compressed as it passes under the um, uh, plantar fascia. And if it is, you can't abduct that fifth toe. Quick, easy test. 
Night braces are effective. I mentioned that research by Kogler in the center. You see varus wedges. Like I said, sometimes I'll just post a felt varus wedge beneath the heel. By itself, that significantly lessens the pressure in the plantar fascia. Deb Nowazenski, the PT from Ithaca College of Physical Therapy, published a paper with a couple of other people. In that top left corner, you see a picture. She just had people stretch the plantar fascia back by pulling the toes back while seated in a figure four position, hold it for 10 seconds, do that 30 times per day. She compared outcomes of conventional treatments with conventional treatments with this. Much better results, uh, published in the journal of bone and joint surgery, much better results with this approach. Um, so easy to do. I thought it'd be difficult when I saw that to get people to do it 30 times a day, but it's not. They don't even have to take their foot off. If they have a flexible shoe on, they can just press it against the side of a wall. The lower left corner shows night, uh, what a night brace is. Uh, Wapner did a study probably 15 years ago um, that showed night braces. You wear them at night. Most people with plantar fasciitis, they sleep with their ankle plantar flex. Plantar fascia contracts, they get out of bed and they just re-rip it. Um, night braces have really nice outcomes, um, especially done in unison with other protocols. Some of my favorite research on the plantar fascia, historically people have said um, people with high arches get it and other people said people with low arches get it. Um, and in this paper they showed uh, movement of the arch did not uh, uh, in any way correlate with the development of plantar fasciitis. When they evaluated sagittal plane motion and looked at what was happening, they showed that the toes move quicker when they went into their propulsive period. So if you have a runner and they have weak intrinsics, especially the flexor digitorum brevis, flexor digitorum brevis sits right under the plantar fascia. If you look at this picture, the plantar fascia has been cut and reflected and pulled back. As I mentioned previously, bone spurs form at the attachment point of flexor digitorum brevis not at the attachment point of the plantar fascia. So if you have someone with chronic plantar fasciitis, they talk about it as load sharing. As you're starting to bear down, if you're strong in the flexor digitorum brevis, it'll decelerate some of the motion. And then at different phases of the gait cycle, it's sharing the stress with the plantar fascia. The plantar fascia has almost no ability to elongate. What this study showed was that people as, with plantar fasciitis had a tendency to have their toes move more rapidly during the propulsive period. That was predictive of the condition. That being the case, the treatment is to strengthen the flexor digitorum brevis. Toe exercises are really helpful. I'll also tell people, look at the insole of your running shoe, um, and I'll give them an external cue. I'll say, I want you, when you're walking and running, to use your toes during your push-off phase of the gait cycle and grab down into the insole. I want to see marks in those insoles. So I'll have people, you pull it out, usually people who have weakness where their toes aren't strong enough and the uh, plantar fascia is being stressed, you'll see a huge wear pattern under the central metatarsal heads, but no wear patterns under the toes. Um, and I'll say, come back in two months or I'll show them how to evaluate it. I want to see the insole breaking down where their toes are. It means they're intrinsically firing. It's hard to get the timing down, you say, just during your push-off phase. But, you know, a little practice, they get it. Um, and strengthen the intrinsics. Sometimes you can strengthen the intrinsics just by wearing minimalist shoes. They're, the flexibility of the toes increases um, the force placed on a really rigid running shoe would stop the toes from bending. You probably lessen stress with the plantar fascia, but it would promote the weakness of the flexor digitorum brevis, so it would be chronic. 10% of people with this condition go chronic. Um, untreated, the typical course for, treat, uh, for plantar fasciitis is about two years. Treated properly tends to not last more than three months. Again, 10% go chronic. When treated right, I don't even find that 10% go chronic. Um, ankle sprains, another common injury in runners. 23,000 people per day will sprain their ankle in the US. This is a big deal. A 10-year follow-up study of patients with ankle sprains, 72% showed signs of arthritis. The most commonly injured ligaments are anterior talofibular and calcanofibular. The stress test on the left side, on the left shows the draw test. You just push the tip back and notice how far it moves. If it's an isolated tear of the anterior talofibular, you'll see the lower leg start to externally rotate because the deltoid ligament is still intact, so the leg rotates back. If the calcanofibular ligament is in, injured, put the ankle in a neutral position, tilt, and you'll see um, increased inversion. You can feel a gap. Sometimes you'll feel a, a large difference between the two sides. Um, the best predictors of ankle sprain, as with everything, a prior history of uh, ankle of injury is, is very important. Also being overweight. Uh, overweight athletes um, that have a prior history are 19 times more likely to suffer ankle sprain. 
Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a tough injury when you keep doing it over and over. The common peroneal nerve is on the side of the leg. They start to overstretch that. They could have delayed recruitment of the peroneals. Um, and then this was an interesting paper of 202 elite runners. They showed that uh, there's a, and this other research showed the same thing, a counterintuitive inverse relationship between the severity of ligament damage and the potential for injury. In a two-year follow-up study, runners with the worst ligament tears rarely have suffered re-injury, uh, between 0 and 5 percent, while runners with um, less severe ankle sprains suffered significantly higher re-sprain um, rates. 18 percent with moderate sprains were re-injured. Another paper showed that athletes with grade three tears rarely re-injure, but the grade ones and twos re-injure constantly. Nobody knows why. Perhaps once the ligaments are torn, you don't get that um, neurological inhibition where you start to roll in your central nervous system, senses that parts of the fibers are gonna rip again, so it shuts the system down, you keep rolling over. But it, uh, I put this study up because a lot of people with grade three ankle sprains are told they need surgical reconstruction. Um, and a great paper came out of Italy that showed that people who got surgical reconstruction for inversion ankle sprains with grade three tears had worse short-term outcomes and worse long-term outcomes. I'll usually tell people with the grade threes, rehab it, strengthen it, don't worry too much about it, but the grade ones and twos, you've got to do a really good job, manipulation, um, increasing mobility of all the tarsal bones. Um, and this was one of my favorite papers related to manipulation for the use of ankle sprains, especially in high arched individuals. I've noticed for 30 years that high arched people, especially if they have midfoot strikes, tend to um, sprain their ankles uh, frequently. Uh, manipulating the mid-tarsal joint, manipulating the first ray, increases stability. Uh, in closed eye balance tests, they improve immediately. It's really clear. Um, and in this paper, which was published in the journal of the JMPT, they took 52 female hockey players with grade two sprains and did some telechoral manipulations, and they showed significant redistributions of load throughout the foot as measured with stabilometric and baropodometric techniques. Um, again, it's very important to get all the joints moving. Also, again, check for isolated contracture of the gastroc. An early heel lift makes the foot unstable, more likely to sprain, so check for gastroc inflexibility. One of my favorite things to do is to use a, a 2010 rock board. I made this rock board because conventional rock boards all go 16 degrees in each plane, and I wanted to put athletes in their pre-sprain position and bring them out of it. So I took a small piece of wood and I took a, a half of a cross ball and I positioned it so the average foot inverts about 18 degrees, everts about nine degrees. So I made a, a, an ankle rock board that puts you through that specific range of motion. It basically puts you in the pre-sprain position. And I'll show you a little clip of that right now. And this is the two to one ankle rock board device. It's got a small ball on the outside of the center, so it's not dead center. So as you'll see, when it tilts, it'll invert one direction, evert another. Um, it's important it doesn't specify right or left because your foot inverts 20 degrees and everts 10. Um, you'll want to position it so your arch goes towards the long side. So my left foot would do it like this. My right foot would be like this. That way you match the two to one ranges of motion present in the body. So to do this, I'll just have the board positioned so they're standing next to a wall. Before the person gets on, I have them stabilize it with the opposite foot. It's very important that they put the foot directly over the center of the strip. If it's too far over one way, they can't move it. If it's too far over this way, they can't move it. But it's not that hard. You just put it right in the center, stand on it, force the periphery of the board to touch the ground. So the knee has to be stiff, a mistake people make or aren't good at it. They'll hit a spot where they, they're weak in their peroneals and they can't get it past it, so they'll move their hip. So you basically want the hip still and with them stabilized on it, you want to watch them roll through a range of motion. Pretty easy to do. You'll do a minute clockwise, a minute counterclockwise. Another thing you can do in addition to rehabbing with an ankle rock board, really simple, just put a J-shaped strap of kinesio tape along the outside of the leg. The, in this paper that I talk about by Matsusaka, um, they wanted to compare the response to balance training with and without a skin taping. And the simple addition of a, if this is the outside of the leg, the simple addition of a piece of kinesio tape along the side, increased sensory input from the skin 
and um, they responded much more quickly. They had better values and postural sway. They returned the baseline within six weeks versus eight weeks without it. And then in the paper below by Osborne, Osborne they showed that if someone's so injured on one side they can't do weight bearing yet, um, uh, you do um, uh, balance exercises on the opposite foot and there is almost 100% crossover where the injured foot that's not being exercised gets increased proprioception just from working the contralateral limb. One paper published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine showed 100% crossover. Uh, I'm not sure I believe that, but um, it, it's uh, I, ever since I read that paper, I constantly rehab the good leg while I'm waiting for the other opposite leg to become weight-bearing. Home exercises for ankle sprains. This is one of my favorite ones. This paper was published in the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy. In this, everybody has a tendency to do conventional work proneus brevis, proneus longus. They just work the injured leg, open uh, kinetic chain. Um, in this paper, the, uh, the authors, the damaged leg is the one without the TheraTube on it. So it's the one with the circle. So weight bearing, just move the leg in. I'll just have them move the leg in a variety of positions. It twists the upper extremity, duplicates the closed kinetic chain activity, controls the transverse plane, frontal plane, sagittal plane. As long as you rotate the body in different positions, I'll usually do three sets of 15 in each one of those angles, um, depending upon uh, how much time they have. That can take a little bit of time. Sometimes I'll just do one set of 15 in every position, coupled with some balance board exercises. One of the most important things to rule out with ankle sprains is that it's not a high ankle sprain. Everybody knows, everybody who treats injuries knows how to rule out syndesmotic. You just take the forefoot, abduct it. If they feel pain in that distal tip fib, then it's a syndesmotic sprain. What I see is that people frequently miss lateral gutter syndromes. After an ankle sprain, the synovium beneath the fibula can get trapped. It's called the lateral gutter. Doesn't show up on MRIs. You can MRI it, everything is clean but they'll have chronic pain just next to their anterior talofibular ligament. Um, nothing works, they have constant discomfort with it. A really simple test is much more accurate than MRI. Have the patient stand, feet together, and then just have them squat down. If that reproduces pain just beneath the talofibular, then they have a lateral gutter syndrome. Um, lateral gutter syndromes are, if, if it's too late, if they're too far gone, they have to be surgically repaired. They arthroscopically just go in and remove the lateral, uh, the synovial hyperplasia. Very effective. The surgery is quick and easy. I've had patients who've had pain for four years, changed their lives where they couldn't do certain things. You know, shortly after that procedure, uh, arthroscopy, they were fine. But you have to diagnose it. You have to be aware that lateral gutter syndrome is a possibility. Compartment syndromes of the leg, when you exercise, blood flow increases. The veins, if they can't keep up or they get compressed, there's five compartments in the leg. A lot of people tell you there's only four, but recently tibialis posterior was named as its own compartment. So if you look at the picture on the left, TPC is the tibialis posterior compartment. Um, and that's a cross section through the middle of the leg. And I like with compartment syndromes, you have to, you have to increase the flexibility of the fascia. Um, the compartment studies where they do, where they put a sensor inside the compartment and have you run, their intraday reliability is not that great. If it's over 30 millimeters of mercury, then it's an issue. But um, almost always, I will aggressively treat it with myofascial work. I'll show them how to foam roll it out and how to stretch each individual uh, compartment. Um, if you look at illustration B there, to stretch tibialis posterior, you bend the knee, ab uh, adduct the forefoot, and if you want to get the flexor digitorum longus, and uh, flex your house as long as put a rolled up towel beneath the, the toes. So uh, the picture on the right is an unusual stretch for proneus longus. A lot of times people will just stretch one muscle, but they'll leave the neighboring muscle alone. Tennis ball be be between your inner forefeet, bend your knees, the tennis ball inverts the inner forefeet, and then as you bend your knees, you'll be pulling on proneus longus specifically. So I'll stretch all the individual muscles with the stretches listed here. In my textbook, I go over all the different stretches that you can do. I'll tend to hold the stretches for 30 seconds, try doing them five times per day. Medial tibial stress syndrome, extremely common in runners. The lower portion of the tibia, um, people used to think that it was just pulling of the soleus, and other people said it was pulling of the flexor digitorum longus, insertional tendonitis, um, treatment with strengthening exercises. 
but these researchers, again, American Journal of Sports Medicine, showed that the tibia and medial tibial stress syndrome subjects is more porous than control subjects. It's not just a tendon uh, enthesopathy, it's a, it's a bony injury. That bone tends to be a little more porous, um, so uh, you have to pay attention to any factors that could be, any dietary factors that could be uh, associated with a lot of runners have a tendency not, especially if they live in the Pacific Northwest, to not get enough vitamin D. So vitamin D supplements to keep cortical bone strong is fine, but um, you have to strengthen all the muscles involved in it. Orthotics have been recommended for medial tibial st stress syndrome for years, mixed results. This was the paper I talked about previously. They just used pressure scans, created orthotics based on force distribution, um, uh, huge reductions in the rate. A control group of military trainees, after seven weeks, 22 cadets from the control group developed medial tibial stress syndrome, one of the most common injuries, only two in the orthotic group. So there were 400 people in this study, um, and outcomes were, were pretty clear that there was a connection. Prior research showed a questionable connection between orthotics and medial tibial stress syndrome. Patellofemoral pain um, syndrome, people have a tendency to look just at VMO, uh, the VMO, the vest medialis obliquus. If it's a little bit weak, it can cause the patella to shift to the side. There's some great research out dating back 15 years now that shows the conventional exercises, seated, toe out, leg extension, a wall presses, ball between your knees, squeezing. They have always been claimed to isolate VMO for more than 15 years. They've shown that they recruit VL with more force, creating a worsening of the imbalance. Fortunately, some great new research is showing that people with straight patellas, if they're lying on the table or if they're seated, um, if their patella is tilted laterally like this, so this would be the right patella, they often respond well to VMO strengthening exercises. But most people with straight patellas, the VMO doesn't, isn't all that essential in keeping that patella in a great position because the femoral condyles do that by themselves. And in this paper below um, by Dirk Nilehamel and Davis, uh, three-dimensional research confirmed with other people had shown it's not the patella moving to the side because of a weak VMO. It's weakness in the hip allowing the femur to turn in. The hip abductors, if they were weak, the positive step-down test we uh, did before, the hip abductors, if they're weak, the femur turns in, lateral femoral condyle hits the back of the patella, causing a lateral patella compression syndrome. Instead of looking at the VMO, look at the hip functional test to isolate it. Um, very important. This was my favorite. Um, again, look at that outcome. Sometimes in D, it's a weakness of the hip external. Other times it's C, um, weakness of the glute med. Again, I like to capture an image of that, usually with the kinesio capture system, so I can measure the angle, I can file it. Um, takes a second and uh, really accurate, good integrated reliability. And this is um, that study, which for vow, uh, a quad inflexibility was a better predictor of chronic retropatellar pain than um, Q angle, than almost any other measurement of the lower extremity. While they're face down, quickly do a heel to buttocks test foam roll, stretch, mobilize, um, restore that flexibility so that they're symmetric. And that's a, a big factor. It's an underrated factor with ret chronic retropatellar pain. Almost everybody, when they think of retropatellar pain, they think put an orthotic in it. But if you remembered back when I started the lecture, I went over research showing that that mitered hinge analogy is wrong. The belief that you can use an orthotic to correct a retropatellar problem comes from that old data that if the foot pronated 15 degrees, the tibia would turn in 15 degrees, but the research showing that the pronators, the subtalar joint, they're stress dissipators. They absorb the force. Everybody, the tibias and pronators and supinators still move the same, yet 25% um, of the population, you put an orthotic in them, if they have retropatellar pain, they'll say, I'm cured. This is, this is wonderful. You can't predict it by measuring frontal plane motion of the rear foot. You know, you, you, people who have retropatellar pain, if you say, well, you're a pronator because I, I saw your calcaneus everge, you put an orthotic in them, outcomes didn't correlate with the degree of, uh, of pronation. So Collins and Crossley in this paper below um, did a clever thing where they said, well, 25% of the people get better, sometimes more. 
Um, we can't figure out why because there's little correlation between the degree of pronation and outcomes with an orthotic and even the degree of pronation and whether retropatellar pain is present. So they just took stock orthotics. You can use um, a taping technique or you can have a couple of stock orthotics lying around. And they had people just do step down tests um, with um, uh, the orthotic in place. And they had a metronome going so it was a certain, certain cycle. If the people said, I feel better when I do that, it meant that it immediately increased the probability that they would get better with um, orthotic intervention from 25% to 45%. Simple test to do, takes a second. You throw a, a stock orthotic in their insoles and just, you can have them squat, you can have them lunges, you just have them do a couple of functional tests. If they feel better, it's a, a higher probability. Again, clinical prediction rules, figuring out ways to predict who will respond to which intervention. Easy to do, great treatment. Next injury that I'd like to talk about, iliotibial band compression syndrome. You notice I didn't call it a friction syndrome. Um, friction syndrome was the belief that it slid back and forth. As I mentioned in the prior section, um, the uh, iliotibial band does not move back and forth, snapping over an epicondyle. It moves in. And if you look at A on the picture on the right, that was the undiscovered band that attached directly to the lateral aspect of the femur, blended in with the periosteum, and if the opposite hip drops when you're running, that band gets pulled. Remember, I mentioned it before, the band itself has a 0.2% ability to elongate, so you can massage it till you're blue in the face and you will not make it more flexible. The glue max, if you look at the picture on the left, and tensor fascia lata are the keys to loosening that up. The, they're stretched differently. The, ilio, the tensor fascia lata is stretched with the leg behind, and the glute max is stretched by shifting at an angle like this. You basically draw a line through the femur, and you can tell which muscle fiber you're uh, stretching. When you do that symmetry uh, test for flexibility, that scan that I did just a little while ago, if you find tightness in tensor fascia lata, address it. Make sure you're doing deep tissue massage and working it. Um, f work the right muscles. Flexibility, in my opinion, is, is something to look at, but it's not the cause of it. When you look at patients who get, and this is that study that I was talking about, how the band snaps back and forth. I showed this previously. But when you look at people who get iliotibial band um, syndrome, especially runners, um, uh, this study was done on 35 runners where they showed that the people who got iliotibial band when they did three-dimensional motion analysis, they dropped the contralateral pelvis. The opposite pelvis dropped lower. And if you look at that, as the pelvis drops, the band pulls, and that attachment point just gets yanked on. It's not the bursar. They don't need to do injections into it. They don't need to surgically remove the bursar. They don't need to do Z-plasties to lengthen the band. You've got to stop that opposite hip from dropping. In this study, it was interesting. They showed no correlation between foot pronation in the presence of a band or foot supination in the presence of a band. It was the um, opposite hip dropping. Strengthening exercises, um, plyometric drills, uh, 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 open and closed kinetic chain exercises, all the things you do to treat uh, femoral antiversion, some of the external cues, uh, hopping on unstable surfaces. Again, you've got to keep that pelvis level, strengthen the hip abductors, have a partner assisted training where you focus on that. Pretty easy to be in front of a mirror and have a, an athlete get on a treadmill and focus on the position of the iliac crest while they're running. Hamstring strains, um, one of the worst injuries that can happen to a runner. Of all the soft tissue injuries present in the tr track and field community, hamstring strains have the highest rate of re-injuries. Over 70% of runners who tear a hamstring will re-tear it within a year. Uh, again, the biceps femoris muscle has a lower attachment, so sprinters with their long strides, their 10, 11 foot stride lengths, as they're swinging that leg forward, they can tear that biceps femoris. Historically, the outcomes have been terrible for the management of that. And then this paper came out in 2004, Sherry and Best. They compared two rehab protocols for the treatment of acute hamstring strains. Um, and again, looking at the research, stretching does not alter re-injury rate, massage does not alter re-injury rate, but the strengthening protocol on the, the left reduced the re-injury rate from 70% to 7%. I did an article for Dynamic Chiropractic where I reviewed this. I summarized some of it up. 
Uh, picture C is an exercise that I prefer for hamstring. I added it to their protocol um, because it isolates, in my opinion, isolates the upper hamstring a little bit better. But um, get this paper, look at the protocol, or go to the article that I wrote for Dynamic Chiropractic a little while, look, look at the paper. It's a great way to drop that injury rate from 70% to 7%. This is some interesting research on piriformis syndrome. Um, historically, when I've treated piriformis syndrome, I've focused on sacroiliac manipulation, lumbosacral manipulation, deep tissue massage, hip mobilization, just lengthening it um, and restoring joint motion like you do with all soft tissue injuries. Um, the picture on the left shows that in certain situations, glute gluteus medius and piriformis blend, but the picture on the right was, a, um, uh, was to point out that the area within an inch of the sacrum is the only region of the piriformis that has enough muscle fibers in it that you can effectively lengthen it. If you want to lengthen piriformis, focus all your effort on that one inch section as it leaves the pelvis. Um, someone did a, a great dissection where they showed that the, the distal half of the piriformis was almost pure tendon. So massaging it, working it, doing injections into it, which a lot of medical doctors do, were useless if you did the distal half. Um, it's the proximal section that makes the biggest difference. My favorite paper on piriformis syndrome um, was published a little while ago in 2010. They came up with a theory that piriformis isn't just tight, that perhaps a, a, a neighboring synergist was weak and it overloaded the piriformis. So they reviewed the literature. They found six different articles where they showed that strengthening exercises done in conjunction with flexibility produce much greater outcomes. And um, they theorized that if glute max was a little bit weak because it has a very long lever arm for controlling internal rotation of the femur, this is especially true on patients with anverted hips. If the hip is turning in excessively, glute max, as I mentioned in the normal gait section, has a powerful lever arm for controlling that. If glute max is even a little weak, then piriformis with its short lever arm has to stress and stress and stress. I had a patient a little while ago, she had external tibial torsion, was told, told to always run with her feet straight. Her glute was a little bit weak. The piriformis couldn't handle controlling all that internal rotation, so it was chronically breaking down. She had like a four-year interruption in her running cycle. She was a D1 runner. She was constantly injured. Um, had to run with a slight toe out, but more importantly, strengthen the glute max. That's what this research showed, that if you strengthen the synergists, I like having people do leg presses with TheraBands around their knees as they push out, bridges with TheraBands around their knees. They use that one in the study quite a bit. And glute medius exercises, three sets of 15. Um, outcomes can be really, are, are great. I've been doing that since I read that paper. Um, and almost everybody gets better with it. And in fact, it always was a frustrating injury to treat. It tended to come back. People with long car rides would come back, long lungs would come back. Adding strengthening exercises really makes a big difference. This is a muscle energy stretch of the piriformis. Um, the, people, the person is on all fours. You, the involved leg is the one that's vertical. You'll raise and lower the, um, the good hip. That leg that's sticking out in that upper left corner isn't doing a thing. You're just raising and lowering it. Um, the, the, the vertical femur is the one that's the most important. And then it's a modified pigeon pose. You just drop back. That's a great muscle energy because it teaches them how to fire the, uh, the piriformis. It stimulates circulation prior to stretching. They don't like overstretching it. And obviously, if they start to feel any paresthesias or tingling, then you're irritating the sciatic nerve. But that's a great muscle energy stretch. Um, I review how to do that um, in my textbook. And, and you really just need to have that pelvis going up and down, up and down, drop back. It's a modified pigeon pose. Greater trochanteric pain syndrome. Um, this is common in older female recreational runners. It's next to hip arthritis. It's the most common cause of hip pain. 99.9% .9 of the medical population will tell you, oh, you have an inflamed bursa under there, just inject the bursa um, and you'll be fine. Uh, corticosteroids are routinely done to treat this. A paper came out a little while ago where they took people with unilateral greater trochanteric pain syndrome, MRI both hips. They had the same prevalence of bursitis in both hips, so it wasn't the bursar that was getting caught. When they did an MRI study, Woodley did this one, um, and they did MRIs to evaluate uh, what was exactly going on with greater trochanteric pain syndrome. 
and they showed insertional tendonitis at glute medius, atrophy of glute minimus. Um, I treat this now with eccentric loads to strengthen those tendons. Um, since I saw this paper, outcomes went through the roof. You can do eccentric loads um, in a bunch of different ways. Um, and you don't even need to do just the eccentric component. I, a lot of times I'll just do sideline hip abduction leg off the table in front of you, sideline hip abduction leg behind, um, squats, presses, um, strengthening the quad, strengthening all the different muscles, um, really effective for treating um, gluteus medius, gluteus minimus atrophy. Another very common injury in runners is um, adductor strains. And one study that came out a while ago in hockey players, not the same, but uh, hockey players who did not have a one-to-one -one ratio between the adductors and abductors were 17 times more likely to get an adductor injury. If a runner complains of adductor injuries, always consider femoral neck stress fracture referring pain, um, a referred pain from the hip, rule out all the other problems first. Um, but in runners that get adductor strains, 99 plus percent of the time, it tends to be tears of the adductor longus muscle. If you go back to the anatomy section, you'll see, um, as I mentioned back there, uh, this study by Strauss showed that adductor um, uh, longus, as you get about a half inch to an inch from its origin off the pubic bone, it narrows to three millimeters. That narrowing makes it extremely prone to injury just like with tennis elbow, people who get tennis elbow always have injury of extensor carpi radialis brevis. People with adductor strains almost always have injury to the adductor longus. Strengthening, they've compared treatment outcomes with flexibility, with massage. Massage and flexibility work will not alter um, the uh, potential for re-injury. You have to strengthen that uh, adductor longus. Uh, and after strengthening it, I like to do agility drills as well and um, great outcomes uh, and leg presses, a bunch of different exercises to strengthen the adductors. And this is a picture, if you look on the, the right side of that, adductor longus where it comes down, it tapers just past where that's cut to three millimeters. So that's the reason that that, because there's adductor brevis, gracilis, magnus, all these pectineus, all these different adductors, it's longus that gets injured. So rehab longus. Um, uh, femoral acetabular impingement syndrome. Um, there's different types, 58% uh, are CAM, 35% com are combined, 6% pincer. Uh, if you look at it, the, the lower drawing is a cross-section of the femoral head as it sits in the acetabulum. Normally, it's a round head and a round socket. Life is wonderful. But if the head is more egg-shaped or CAM-shaped, it can butt into the acetabulum and produce, produce impingement. And also, if the acetabulum pops out, it can butt in. So in C, it's the acetabulum. Only 6% of FAIs are the result of that. More often than not, there are CAM-related issues. Um, I like to treat, and the, the test for it, impingement test on the upper right, uh, hip flex crossover, not super accurate. Log roll test, um, but you will get a pinching in the groin with that impingement test. Not accurate for identifying labral tears, that, even though it's used all the time, but it's accurate for finding femoral acetabular impingement syndrome. If they're tight in the external rotators, and this is very important, in runners, they have a tendency for tightness in the external rotators, and very few people ever talk about this, but you can get a dynamic impingement syndrome, a dynamic femoral acetabular impingement syndrome, and that responds beautifully to mobilization. What typically happens is that if you look at a femoral head, it rolls like this in the acetabulum. If you're tight in the external rotators, that's where my thumb is. Whether or not you have a cam uh, or a pincer in, uh, anatomy or not, if you're tight in the external rotators and you horizontally flex the hip, you'll get impingement of the front. I've had countless runners who uh, were told or felt they had an iliopsoas bursitis. You bring the leg up, cross it over so you'll horizontally flex it and they report immediate pain with that impingement test, that one on the right. You do deep tissue massage in the piriformis, and I um, did the mobilization the other day. We'll cue to it in a second. A mobilization where you take the femur, drop down, stretching the piriformis. It's very important because it also stretches the obturator internus. Obturator internus, in my opinion, plays a huge role in femoral acetabular impingement syndromes, and it's underappreciated. If you can improve the flexibility of the obturator internus muscle, You'll allow that to glide, and you'll get, it's, it's immediate. You'll get 
as soon as you retest it, they can horizontally flex through a larger range. I'll show them that muscle energy piriformis stretch that um, I did. They often have to come back to get the hip mobilized because it can take, you know, a couple of months to get that hip moving. Avoiding sleeping positions. If they have retroverted hips and they sleep, retroverted hips turn out farther than they turn in. People who have that are prone to this um, because they can sleep with their leg in a figure four. Puts the piriformis in the optrator, whether they do a face down or face up, puts the piriformis in the optrator in a shortened position and adapts to it. Chronic contracture can be hard to undo, but the hip mobilization that I did in the video is really an effective way coupled with that muscle energy mobilization. It's just a great way to increase flexibility in that tissue, um, and it shows that there's more to impingement syndromes than just bony bridges. It's very dynamic. They've shown with shoulders, if you're tight in infraspinatus, studies where they put silk sutures in the infraspinatus and then did horizontal flexion, created an altered axis of motion. Instead of the humeral head moving in the glenoid fossa like this, when they put silk sutures in infraspinatus, it moved like this and slammed back and forth. So what basically happens with this is that chronically putting a leg in an externally rotated position, the stresses of running, Titan's obturator internus, very common, alters the axis of motion. Sometimes their only symptom is, adduct, is groin pain. It can be misdiagnosed as an adductor injury, but um, can be reproduced with the impingement test and mobilization restores that range pretty quickly, even though it has a tendency to come back. Pay attention to sleeping positions, pay attention to sitting positions, and uh, watch form on the home exercise. They've got to do that home mobilization with great form. It's difficult to get that down, but with practice, as long as they're moving the opposite pelvis up and down, and then do that stretch where they'll feel that pull, they do it every day for about three or four minutes. Crossover sign is uh, if you're looking at an AP x-ray, um, uh, the, the front of the acetabulum crosses over normally. If you look at line C, the front of the acetabulum is behind the back of the acetabulum. That crossover sign is a sign that that could be a cause of impingement. And then uh, measuring alpha angle, usually on an MRI, bisect the femoral neck, take a 90 degree angle to the point um, of, of the, the circle, and then just measure the radius. Normally, you're less than a 50 degree angle where the femoral neck joins the, the round femoral head with a cam um, presence, that femoral neck juts out where the word cam is printed there, and it joins farther down. So the alpha angle in cam is often around 80 degrees. Um, that Y portion is a cam impingement. The X mark is where a typical femoral neck would join. This is the hip muscle energy mobilization that I love. Um, straight long axis compression. They'll push for five seconds, relax, push for five seconds. I vary the angle, I vary my position. Outcomes with that are phenomenal. When done correctly, running is no more stressful on the body uh, than fast walking. In a recent series of important in vivo studies, Lundgren et al. and Arndt et al. inserted self-drilling intracortical pins into nine bones of the foot and ankle to evaluate motion of the rear foot, midfoot, and forefoot as six male subjects walked across the level train. In all of the situations, Motion, ranges of motion in the joints for feet, uh, the feet were greater while the subjects were walking than during slow running. Slow running is easy on the body. The clinical implication of this is that slow running is no more difficult on the body than walking. And just because someone has an injury um, or feels that running is stressful, uh, running is a great activity. Running five to 10 miles a week will increase your lifespan. Six years, um, a great way to, to treat depression, diabetes, Alzheimer's, um, easy sport to do. Treat it right, and athletes will be running for decades. Thank you.